Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir and welcome. My name is Leslie Weir, and I'm delighted to be here tonight as the Librarian and Archivist of Canada, as a longtime colleague of Seymour, and as an avid reader. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge that we're gathered here today on the land that is the traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation. I'm very pleased to join hands with the Vera Jewish Canadian Studies Program at the University of Ottawa for this event. Tonight, we add three more titles to the growing list of books that have been launched here in the Pelin Room. And I couldn't be prouder to celebrate these books and the brilliant people who wrote them. Lire est tellement enrichissant. Les livres occupent une place de choix dans la vie des Canadiens et contribuent de belles façons à notre uh, vitalité culturelle. Let me begin by introducing an author, editor, translator of over 70 books. He has definitely secured his place as a writer to be reckoned with. Fortunately for us at Libraries and Archives Canada, his archival font can be found in our collection here. In fact, his font contains a fascinating treasure trove of records from 1954 through 1976. He is, of course, very well known in the literary and cultural community, not only for his prodigious works, but also for his ongoing support of created, creative and artistic expression, and for his work as a publisher, a teacher, and a mentor. So without further delay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Seymour Maine to the podium a literary giant, a great friend of LAC, and a longtime colleague of mine. Merci et bonsoir. I don't recognize myself in all those fine words, you know. I try to stay humble. My students make me feel humble because no matter what I tell them to read, they still don't read it, so they don't know too much of what I've been doing for all those years. Nonetheless, I'm happy to be here. When I arrived in Ottawa 47 years ago to teach at the University of Ottawa, my first place to do research was then the National Library and Public Archives of Canada, now thankfully married together in a union called Library and Archives Canada. And I started doing my earliest research here, not as a writer, but as my critical work here, and I loved it. The only thing I had to complain about was the cafeteria upstairs and their coffee. That's all, otherwise everything was wonderful here. Um, so I'm pleased to be here today, and this is, and it's actually quite um, a wonderful um, concatenation of, of events and people that I was introduced by the new, you know, National Li Librarian Archivist, Leslie, who was the chief librarian at the University of Ottawa. So you may get the feeling that the University of Ottawa has put you into a web. We have tonight. Everything to do tonight is connected with people who have one way or another either taught or are students of mine. Uh, at the University of Ottawa over the past 47 years. It just happened to turn out that way. Uh, all the readers that I'm going to introduce in the first book, which is called Bridges, uh, are connected to the university, who are students or students and faculty at the university over the past 40 years. The one person in the book, I won't tell you who that person is, is connected to the university because one of that person's children got a bachelor of uh, social science at the University of Ottawa, and I consider that enough of a uh, passepartout to get into the, the book. So a number of people in the book uh, will get up and read in alphabetical, I'll tell them, I'll call them out now, I'll tell them who they, when they should come up in alphabetical order. And this book comes out of a continuous circle that I kind of cultivated when I began to teach at the university starting in January 1st, 1973. And I want to tell you a little bit of the history because we need to forget about history. When I got to the University of Ottawa, it was a very small, ingrown institution, only 10,000 people. Uh, everywhere I turned, there was uh, someone above me was an oblate. My dean was an oblate, the librarian was an oblate, the head of the university press was an oblate, the president was an oblate, and next door to me was a sister of St. Anne in her office. So I felt really, uh, this was a really Catholic institution. I had no idea when I accepted to come. I thought the University of Ottawa, but I didn't know its Catholic its background. But 
there was a strong literary group in the department under the late uh, uh, Gilles Marcotte, who was a colleague of mine, who fostered a great interest in Germain Lee Hopkins and in Catholic writers. And there was a group called the Inscape Group. They published a magazine, and I get to think that we're continuing, and it all started in 1957, so it's actually now going on to 70 years or more, this, this kind of tradition, which the university should be more aware of. It's been going on that long. So these uh, writers were part of a group that, over the years, would meet once every month, re read each other's work, help each other along, and over the years, I've managed to have hundreds of students but only dozens have come through this circle. They come, they go away, they come back. And what was a very a fruitful for me to see is that some of them, all of them here have been published. Many of them have published books of their own. One of them tonight, Nicola Volpe, will be launching one of his first, second, third, or fourth, or fifth book now. So I've been happy that throughout the years I've had, I've seen these students, now writers in their own right, publish and get the renown they deserve for their own work. So we're going to start with a selection from Bridges, our little anthology, which you can pick up afterwards, um, beautifully done by my publisher at the last minute. We're going to have Shai Ben Shalom, followed by Jerry Golan, followed by um, uh, Betty um, Warrington Kersley, and last, Erwin Weens. They're not all the writers. These are the ones who were able to come tonight. Each one will say a few words about themselves and read you a little bit of a selection of their work, and then we will move on to the second uh, segment of the evening. Tonight, it's called a triple launch. Basically, it's a triple degree. You're gonna get a triple degree tonight, and uh, like a real fierce, passionate burn of literature uh, by the end of the evening. So, uh, Shai, uh, would you like to start the readings, please? Imagine, you envision a world of perfect harmony. Show me two individuals in one room without a conflict, and I will show you two liars. Roots. Ancestry.ca offers a new service. Analyzing my DNA, they will uncover my ethnic mix, discover distant relatives, find new details about my cultural heritage. Satisfied customers see themselves in a whole new way. This guy is confirmed to be of Irish, Scandinavian, Western European, and British origin. He's smiling, proud to know his breed. I will skip this opportunity. I already know my genetic makeup. 98% chimpanzee. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Jerry Goland, uh, native of Montreal, but uh, living in Ottawa for some time. This is uh, an excerpt from my autobiography, which is still in progress. Uh, I was outside of Canada for 20 years. This is uh, a piece that happened in November of 1986 and almost to the day, uh, 33 years ago. Uh, it's called The Interview. Istanbul, November 1986. I had no idea what my next move would be. I was penniless, wandering the narrow streets near Istanbul's main post office where my post box did not 
hold a hoped-for bank draft for my mother. At the Serkeji ferry terminal, I bumped into an old friend. Richard was working at Bosphorus University teaching preparatory English to first-year students. A colleague of his, a Mr. Sunal, had a daughter who was attending a new private school, uh, and two British teachers had just quit. Uh, the school had only opened a couple of months previously, and they were on a frantic search to find replacement teachers. Richard gave me a phone number and urged me to call immediately if I was interested in the job. Well, to get to the interview, I had to take a two-hour ferry boat ride to the island of Buyukada. I rummaged through my pockets looking for change, begged our housemate Hande for a few lira, and managed to scrape up the return boat fare. I made my way to Kadikoi Harbor and boarded the ferry that would take me across the Sea of Marmara to meet a Dr. Godfrey. I was worried he would ask for a CV or teaching diploma. All I had was a fake, letter-sized teaching certificate. A short walk brought me to a modest building. At the top of a flight of stairs, I timidly knocked, and the door cracked open as far as the safety chain would allow. A suspicious pair of eyes looked me up and down, and Dr. Godfrey ushered me in after I mumbled that I was there for the interview. He was a short man in his 60s wearing baggy trousers, a shapeless cardigan, and of all things, a hairpiece. I tried not to stare. He led me through a narrow hallway into a dingy, unkempt living room. Papers and books covered a large wooden table, which nearly filled the room. Heavy curtains covered the windows, blocking out the sun and air. In the dark and stuffy room, I could just make out bookcases and religious icons hanging on the walls. My host stood barely five feet tall in his plaid carpet slippers, his reddish, ill-fitting toupee topped off his odd appearance. Dr. Godfrey clearly enunciated every syllable he spoke. Would you care for some tea? He asked. I accepted, hoping there'd be a bite to eat served along with it, as I was faint from hunger. He returned with a pot of tea and cups and saucers. I could add a drop of whiskey if you'd care for a wee dram, he said enticingly. I refused, knowing that even a sip would incapacitate me. I drank my tea slowly and nibbled on one dry biscuit he'd placed on my saucer. I hadn't had a job interview in over two decades, and now I was stealing myself to be interrogated for a position for which I had no qualifications or experience. Doctor, but Dr. Godfrey did not, in fact, initiate an interview, but appeared to want to just talk about himself. After what seemed like hours, the doctor still had not asked a single question about my experience or myself. I was squirming in my seat, waiting for the inevitable ax to fall. But he continued his monologue. He eventually touched on the educational foundation that had hired him to recruit foreign teachers. But he drifted back to his life story for another hour or so, at which point I was forced to interrupt to say that the last ferry to Istanbul was leaving shortly and that my wife and five children were expecting me back. He seemed taken aback by the size of my family and mumbled something under his breath before asking me the dreaded question. Have you any documents? I handed over my bogus diploma, which claimed I was a qualified ESL teacher. Is this all you have? His voice trailed off. All right, we'll uh, have to manage. He wrote down an address and handed it to me. You can start on Monday. As the Brits would, I was, as the Brits would say, gobsmacked. Months later, Dr. Godfrey confided that he'd taken a chance on me based on my refusal of the weed dram. 
He was sick of British alcoholics whose absenteeism at school had caused him no end of trouble. But as it turned out, my fake teaching certificate was the least of that foundation's troubles. Three years after I started there in 1989, Dr. Godfrey, whose many degrees and diplomas were no more legitimate than mine, absconded with over $250,000 of the foundation's money. Thank you. Good evening. I'm oh, good evening. I'm Betty Warrington Kearsley, and uh, I was born in England, brought up in Singapore, and uh, and after a long career in physiotherapy, I have now retired and now write. So I write short stories, and I'm and poetry, and um, <clears throat> I'm in the throes of putting together a collection of short stories by and by. And this evening I would like to read to you um, sections of the uh, story that's in the Bridges Anthology. So, and it's called, it's based in Singapore, in a Singapore fishing village, and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'll start right away. This is the temple healer. Raise it a little. How's that? Is that much better? I need to lower it a bit more, I think, yes. Right, okay. Su Yin, about 13, who lives with her Chinese grandmother in a Singapore fishing village, wakes up one morning to discover an alarming rash all over her shoulders and arms. And fearing she would be scarred for life, she plans to attend the, the weekly government outreach mobile clinic that afternoon. But grandmother has no faith in modern medicine and hates anything foreign. After herbal remedies didn't work their expected wonders, she declares Suyin has serpent rash. After school, she bikes to the clinic parked at the entrance of the village where a gawking crowd gathers. It's weeping eczema the nurse says after examining Suyin's rash. Let's try calamine lotion and a zinc ointment. Come back if it isn't better. The remedies fail. The rash race rages on. Grandmother shakes her head sad sadly and concludes that Suyin is possessed by some Christian devil which in a Taoist household inhabited by the eight immortals is causing a war of deities who are retaliating by blighting her silk screen skin. I'm taking you to the temple for healing, she says. See if the old Taoist elder there doesn't tell you I'm right. Then the church priest comes to request Su Yin's confirmation. Grandmother was outraged. No way, no way. Baptism was already a sign of possession. Now he wanted that confirmed. Worse, he wore black robes. Black augurs ill. When, she, when he left, she smudged the room with incense burning furiously from the censer to purify the room, including beneath and around the seat he'd sat on. Suyin was, was confirmed after a dreadful row with grandmother, who convulsed with rage when she declared her appointment with the Holy Ghost. She adores the idea of the Holy Ghost, the energetic, all-powerful spirit, principal mover and shaker in that triad, the Trinity. God's in his heaven, and Jesus, who rose from the dead, gives God a hand. <clears throat> she reasons, yet all's never well in the world engaged in constant chaos. So there's only the Holy Ghost left. Um, <clears throat> to deal with the endless task of fixing things, of which the most difficult and exasperating is that of renewing a right spirit in the human heart. Surely the Holy Ghost could influence grandmothers. Suyin was still wary that grandmother might somehow smell traces of the Holy Ghost about her 
when they lit the daily joss together at the family altar, but the immortals kept her secret. Now, at the temple, Grandmother hobbles ahead of Su Yin on her tiny bound feet. Shedding footwear, they enter the cool dark hall, an oil lamp flickers on the altar. Joss smoulders in three brass urns. The temple elder emerges, barefoot, in boxer shorts, toweling his wet hair, chest, back, and ears. He has just bathed, he explains. Grandmother relates the reason for their visit. He examines the rash closely, nods, and leads Suyin to the altar. He lights several joysticks and places them in the urns. Hold out your arms, child, he instructs. He spreads his rough, scarred fisherman's hands over her arms. His long, curved, tobacco-stained fingernails deftly wave a flurry of Chinese characters over her arms and shoulders three times. Su Yin feels only the movement of the air over the affected parts. He turns to the altar, takes a slip of yellow prayer paper, brushes a few Chinese characters on it in red ink from a writing tablet palette, dries it in the air, and presents it to Su Yin. Take this home. Burn it over a bowl of fresh tea and drink every drop understand? She nods. Come back next week to show me the rash, if it's still there. Suyin regards him skeptically. All he's done is write in the air over the rash. If, if, he, if he really expects it to disappear, he must be a faith healer. Her brow furrows. Hmm. Jesus was a faith healer. Perhaps Jesus wor is working through him, she muses. Perhaps that's how it's done. Oh, Eve, little faith, she recalls his words. I know what you're thinking, the elder's voice interjects her thoughts. She, she blushes. Don't be afraid. Your grandmother is so anxious about you. She's brought you here to be healed. She has infinite faith, enough for you too. All will be well, believe me. Suyin fulfills his instructions to the letter. She lights the slip and holds it over the steaming tea until the last crisp, curling black fronds of burnt paper descend to the bottom of the bowl. She sips every drop of the ash and smoke-flavoured tea with the essence of the elder's words written on it. Stillness diffuses through her being. And to find out what happens next, you'll have to read the full story in the Bridges Anthology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Irvin Weems. I became Seymour student up. I became Seymour student quite late in life after more than a decade working in what was then called the Department of the Secretary of State. And it's thanks largely to Seymour that I rarely regretted the change in career. Uh, I'll read two poems. Um, first one is called Dirty Pockets. It happens often when you're just a boy. You forget what's in them. Unthinking, you plunge your hand down and feel something. Then you remember, you pull out your hands, sticky, ugh. When you're only four feet tall, your pockets are close to the ground, so dirt gets in. Also cookie crumbs, peanut shells, the wad of chewing gum you were saving for later, not to mention other treasures, some of them unmentionable, like the butt of a cigarette you found and might try to smoke when no one's looking the robin's egg you stole from the nest just to be cruel, or the dead mouse you planned to hide in your sister's shoe. Normally, they're not a hindrance, dirty pockets. They don't weigh you down, don't impair your balance and make you stumble. But even for a boy, there comes a day when they become a burden. Time to clean house, 
turn the pockets inside out and give him a good shake. There, gone. Now the boy can start all over with clean pockets. When he's a grown man, it won't be that easy. And the other poem I'll read is Heavy Lifting. They start before the first graying of dawn, the darkest hour. Thrushes, then jays, gulls, warblers, and all 14 varieties of sparrows. A cacophony of chirps and calls and incoherent trills, and it works. A crack opens at the edge of the earth, and the dark begins to pale. And yes, there it is, a thin, shimmering arc breaching a gap in the red horizon. Now sing, you feathered fool, sing, sing, and louder sing for every fiber in your puny breast. Yes, yes, here it comes, the whole flaming orb buoyed upon a wave of weightless song. Now they can relax and turn their minds to worms and fuzzy things with seeds. Thank you. There are more writers in the book. Uh, they were not able to join us today for various reasons. And uh, this book, uh, I had this idea of this book for about two, three years, and a number of the people in the group worked on it. But we never could get it together, but we were lucky that uh, the, the reader who was going to read after we do my book, Nicola Volpe, showed up. And Nicola was very talented in IT, plus uh, as an academic scholar, poet, and I'll tell you more about him when, he, when I introduce his book. He came to save our bacon, as the expression goes, and so we are able to offer this book. And you can, uh, uh, these are all samples of works. I'm hoping that Jerry's memoirs will be published in the next year or two, and they'll be launched here. I'm hoping that Betty's memoir stories will be published as well. Uh, I know Shai has published a number of books and booklets. One day he's going to have a big book, uh, and I hope to push him towards there. And Erwin has uh, only recently joined the, uh, uh, the ranks of the bards, uh, but he has another book, uh, I think a very important scholarly book, which I hope one day will see the light of uh, print. So uh, the next stage is, uh, here I'm going to be doing what you're not supposed to do, introduce yourself, not really. Uh, the, next, uh, the next one is the book, you see, it's in Russian which I used to be able to read when my late grandmother, blessed memory, spoke to me in Russian, but now I, my Russian is rusty completely. And uh, uh, this is a book of my um, word sonnets. So I'm, uh, supposedly they say, if you look up the history of the sonnet on Wikipedia, you'll find out that I'm the, I'm the internationally most innovative person with the word sonnet. What is the word sonnet? It is a short poem, 14 lines, one word per line, a kind of anorexic sonnet when you think of the Italian sonnet. And I've been doing it for about 20 years. It was actually pioneered by the Irish poet Augustus Young, and he calls me his Saint Paul because I took the word sonnet out of England and made it uh, internationally known, and I have imitators in many countries now where I've given lectures. People love this short 14-word poem, and I want to just tell you a little bit more about it. How did uh, Augustus discover? He took Churchill's History of the English People and fed it into his computer in 1998, and he found that the average number of words in the Churchillian sentence was 14. He put it down, listed it like a found poem, and Eureka, it struck him that uh, Rambo had actually tried to write a one-word sonnet, and there were one or two others. And he began to spread word of it. I heard of it when I was in London. My, we have the same publisher in London. I brought it back to Canada, as I said, like his St. Patrick or his St. Paul. And I created a whole bevy of word sonneteers here in Ottawa. And there's actually one international anthology of word sonnets on the web, if you look up a foreplay, an anthology of word sonnets. It all includes Ottawa poets who wrote word sonnets 15 years ago, and it shows up everywhere. I'm absolutely astonished that a group of poets, most of them were my students, did a bunch of new work, which is quoted all over the world, and now we have imitators all over. So, how did this book, uh, my, this, the, word, the Cusp is a later book of mine, a beautifully produced book of my word sonnets, and 19, uh, in, uh, five years ago, 
I tried a new thing in the Department of English. I gave a, a seminar, a complete year seminar, on a poet who had never had a seminar done in him before, the late Leonard Cohen. Oh, and of course, I was mobbed. We didn't have enough seats in the room. I opened it up beyond the seminar, and one of the people in it uh, was interested in it, and we talked, and uh, I think he said he was going to translate one or two of my word sonnets, and I challenged him to do a book. Well, now we have the book, Misha, and you did a great job, and Natasha also helped you with it along the way. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mikel, known to me as Misha, uh, who has not only translated my word sonnets, he's also translated quite a number of Leonard Cohen songs. And in this very room, two, night, two weeks from today, we are going to have an homage to, uh, or homage to Leonard Cohen on the anniversary of his passing. And there's going to be a performance that Jerry Golan, you heard before telling you about his adventures of his pedagogical career in Istanbul. Uh, he's going to lead the Tower of a Song local group in playing uh, Leonard songs. And Misha is going to do a few in his Russian translation. All circles come back to the Library and Archives Canada one way or another, as you can see. So um, Misha, you want to join me up here? And then, uh, uh, Natasha Natalia wrote an introduction telling and uh, telling the uh, the world uh, the people in uh, reading it in Russian something about me and when I first got it I looked at it and said what is she writing about but I want to tell you thank God for Google translation I was able to check it out to make sure that what she was saying was something that my mother in heaven would approve so she did write some nice things and uh, you want to come up and say a few words about what you did in your introduction, and then we're going to offer you some samples in both languages. Bonsoir, madame et monsieur. Здравствуйте, добрый вечер, дамы и господа. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, and uh, Mr. First Secretary of the Embassy of Russian Federation. Uh, thank you for coming here again. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't happen every day that a book in Russian uh, is being launched here within these walls. Actually, it's happening for the first time ever. So it's a historical event indeed. Though our book uh, is not uh, huge, it's not a thick volume, but it's a, it's a significant book nevertheless because it brings together two poetic traditions um, a Canadian poetic tradition and uh, a Russian poetic tradition. When I first was exposed to Canadian poetry in 19, back in 1990s, uh, the first impression I got was, oh wow, it's experimental poetry. Canadian poetry is experimental poetry. No wonder I had that impression. It was uh, a volume of uh, visual poetry, of international visual poetry, and Canadian poetry, Canadian segment was very prominent uh, in it. And uh, then I came to Canada 19 years ago, oh my God, 19 years ago, and Seymour was, on, was one of the first people uh, that I met. And um, I thought, oh my God, Canadian poets are amazing people, great people, to listen to uh, and um, to know and uh, to be, uh, well, I, I, I was uh, very excited. And uh, uh, finally, uh, many years ago, here I am, uh, introducing our labor of love, uh, the book originally written by Seymour and translated by my friend uh, uh, Misha Rikov, uh, the book that I helped to appear by um, discussing uh, at length uh, choice, our choices of words, of syntax, of um, various elements of poetic form. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, that um, this uh, cute little book, uh, which is, as I've already said, a historical volume, nevertheless, um, will be um, a beginning of something new um, and uh, will promote further cultural collaboration between uh, 
Russian, Russia and Canada between our two uh, great cultures and maybe something else will come out and will be launched here sometime later. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, and I hope you will enjoy uh, Seymour and Misha reading in uh, the English original and in Russian translation, respectively. Thank you so much. Thank you. I should also mention that uh, Natasha came to Canada under the International Council of Canadian Studies program, I believe, in those days when it was a flourishing program and brought many scholars and writers to Canada, as a result of which, just recently, a book of this book actually appeared in Latin America in Spanish Portuguese translation, along with a French translation for a four language version of the poems. So these word sonnets have gone someplace. For me, there's also another side, the biographical side, which uh, I was telling a member of the embassy that uh, my grandfather came to Canada over 110 years ago from Russia after serving in the Tsarist army. Uh, he was supposed to be a good soldier, but by the time his unit got to um, Siberia, the Russo-Japanese War was over, he reminded me. But he came to Canada because he had members of his family, so it's a kind of, and we lost contact with all members of our family in the 1930s. So I'm hoping that uh, this book, and if Misha and I go to St. Petersburg and Moscow that way, well, maybe I'll find some lost, lost relatives. I also hope that perhaps, uh, who knows, I may win uh, or get uh, imitators who will also try to write word sonnets in Russian because I'm, this is a bit like, you know, a bit of like a, a, um, a world movement. So uh, we're going to read a few poems and we thought the best thing for us to do is for me to read the English first, slowly, and then, for especially those of you who, who's, who understand that Russian is one of your languages, well then, Appreciate the Russian while you've already heard the plot of the poem in English. The first poem is the title poem of the book, Cusp. On the cusp of the new morning, it's still dark as a cat's heart. Peak. На самом пике утренней зари ты видишь то же, что в чужой душе, потемки. I take it that's for the translator. <laughs> if you have any applause for me, you don't have to give it right away. Keep an account of it and then give me the full sweep at the very end. So it'll be nice and long. The next one is, you know the expression, for the birds. In English, for the birds, you know, it means nothing, but this one. For the birds. Travel is strictly for the birds. No lineups, no security checks, no departure taxes. Для птиц. Путешествие исключительно для птиц. Ни ожиданий, ни проверки багажа, so my, uh, my, uh, in my addition to the practice of the word song, which started in England and in Ireland in the 1990s, was to add humor and wit. Uh, they were writing pretty deadpan, uh, lyrical and natural, and poems about nature, and I wrote a lot with humor, which I thought was needed in this wonderful form. Hide and seek. God hid, but forgot to tell us there is no more hide and seek. Прятки. Бог спрятался, но нам забыл сказать, что больше не играет с нами в прятки. You know, in the vision of Isaiah, there'll come a time in the future when there will be no strife in the world and none between animals, predators, and those preyed upon. This one's called Sleep In. The lamb lay beside the wolf. Which of them got a good night's rest? Ночевка. Ягненок рядом с серым волком лег. Из них двоих кто за ночь лучше отдохнул?
But in some of the poems, I could not help but play with sound and alliteration and try to give a sense of a picture in a very short number of words. Flight. A flutter of wings and the feathers of snow fill the eyes with flight. Полет, порхание крыльев, перья снежных хлопьев, в своем стремительном кружении, тобою завладев, глаза наполнили полетом. Waken. The day never ends. Somewhere it is beginning to waken all but the dead. Пробуждать. День не заканчивается никогда. Он где-то только зарождается и начинает пробуждать всех, кроме мертвых. I didn't want to read the next poem, but it was uh, Misha who pressed me to do it. It's called 65 Years Young. That was a long time ago, let me tell you, for me. It was written for a former student of mine as a professor. I taught in Spain for a while. Old? Just the clothes, my friends. The boy still has mischief in his bones. Юноша 65 лет. Старый? Друзья, стар лишь костюм. У парня с порохом и шилом все в порядке. From the laughter, I think that the essence of the wit is coming through in the Russian. Wind and wood. Frivolous, we pass the hours. Ears gently tapped by a xylophone of wind and wood. Ветер и деревья. Мы проводим беззаботно час за часом. В ушах постукивает мягко ксилофон. Ветра и деревьев. So this poem has a, what we call an intertextual fancy word for meaning. It refers to something else, and you all have seen Fiddler on the Roof. I grew up in Montreal too, like Jerry did. When I was young, no fiddler dared to play on an icy Montreal roof. Скрипач. <laughs> Когда был юн я, ни один скрипач не смел играть на монреальских крышах ледяных. And one of my favorite poems. We're not supposed to have favorites, but this is my favorite. It's called Used Car. Old age is like a used car. No sooner fix one part, another goes. Автомобиль был. Преклонный возраст, как БУ автомобиль. Едва одну деталь починишь, как тут же барахлит другая. Edge. With the cutting edge of a word, you sever the taut membrane between us. Режущие свойства. Используя слова, их остроту и режущие свойства, ты рассекаешь тугую мембрану, которая разъединила нас. I rarely write a blessing type of poem. This was written for a late dear friend of mine who passed away four years ago. As a professor at Ryerson University, his name was Adam Furstenberg, who actually spent the war years with his mother in uh, in Soviet Asia, and they escaped after 1941 when uh, Nazi armies invaded uh, uh, Eastern Poland. Day for Adam Furstenberg. Blessed is the light that returns, renewing the day different from all other days. Dean, Adamu. Furstenberger. 
Благословен будь свет, что возвращается старательно, раскрашивая день, рассвечивая каждый по-иному, как никакой другой. And the last poem we'll read. Gravity. Molecules, breasts, the kiss of fingerprints. What did we let fly from love's gravity? Oh, oh, I'm, okay. It's payment time, right, okay. <laughs> Притяжение, молекулы, округлости грудей, прикосновение пальцев. Чему еще позволили мы улетучиться, преодолеть законы притяжения любви? You can pick up a copy of this. It'll only be sold here because, as you know, the original edition is supposed to be sold in Canada, but the, this is supposed to be sold outside of Canada. But we have a quantity of these beautifully produced books, and I have to say, I'm ready to uh, become a, a member of the Russian Writers Union only because this is a sewn book with signatures, such as we don't see in Canada hardly from any publisher. So this book. This book is going to outlast all my English language books, which are perfect bound. They're going to fall apart in 50 years. This book will last two, three hundred years. It's amazingly, beautifully produced. So it's my pleasure now. One of the people in Bridges is uh, Nicola Volpe, one of the, and the one who, as I said, saved our bacon. We were uh, trying to put this book together with selections and differences, and uh, he came along. He cut through all the red tape that we had created amongst each other and edited and put it together and, and then put it in a form that my publisher was really interested in publishing this lovely little anthology. Nicola, this past year, has published a book of his own, um, Insult to the Brain. Uh, no, don't worry, it's nothing to do with neurology. These are uh, very, uh, uh, very, I would say, wonderful literary poems. Each poem in the book is addressed to another either Canadian or international poet and about how each one of these poets has passed away. It sounds lugubrious, but it isn't. And each one of the poems, he has managed to try to get a kind of a, a sense of the sound of the original of their poem. So it's quite a, a tour de force. And typically, it'll probably be neglected in Canada, but I know right away, I already heard that it's already got a fantastic review or notice in England because there they do appreciate good literature, and we have to try to do that here in English Canada as well, to get people to understand that literature is not just of the moment, it's not just a fashion, it's not just advocacy for a political point of view, but it's something that carries forward long tradition of human expression and also is written with beautiful words. It has vision to it, and if possible, even adds the element of wisdom, which makes literature that much more important than ephemeral journalism and other writings. So I'm happy to bring up, uh, ne uh, invite Nicola to come up and read a few selections from his book, Nicola Volpe. I think I should thank you very much for, for coming tonight. I think I should disavow most of what Seymour said. I'm not sure about this wisdom or cutting through red tape or any of that, uh, but thank you very much. Um, it's always difficult to um, decide what to read because how long you read, not for very long, um, but give people a little bit of a look at things. Since uh, they're I'm coming up the stairs and then I found out there, and uh, Misha, um, there are some Russians here, and I do not uh, speak Russian, but do any of you know Victor Serge, who was born of Russian parents in Belgium, lived the life of a professional revolutionary, started out as an anarchist, um, then went to this, he was born in, uh, let me just make sure I have the date right, 1890 in Brussels, and uh, died in Mexico City in 1947 of a heart attack in a taxi. In the meantime, he spent a life as a professional revolutionary, so... Um, and he'd gone after um, uh, Belgium and France. He went to Russia, 
the new Soviet Union back to, I think he was in Spain for a while and ended up having to go to Mexico after the Spanish Civil War. Anyway, this is called Revolutionary Unrepentant. The first came stillborn, the second was indentured, the third went to prison. The fourth and the fifth were twins. They went east into the taiga and were not heard of again. The sixth tried to make amends for the third and became a policeman. The last joined the anarchist and wrote poems. The first was buried in a bit of cloth. The second fell lame and was hungry. The third found unemployment, breaking fingers and hands. Rivers cut the taiga and the steppe, and every, at every crossing a boatman waits for his coin. The sixth was meticulous and rose through the ranks on merit. And the last? The last was beaten and deported. The first had no name and hence cannot be remembered. The second sat on a snow-covered hill. He looked down at the bright sky, city sky, the tiny lights, the stars above, and decided to sleep. The third fell mysteriously ill and took weeks to expire. Of the fourth and the fifth I have spoken already. The wind hisses across the water. The boatman pulls at his oars. The sixth was assassinated at the height of his career. In the flower of his years, a young girl from the mountains with a smile, a white ankle, and a knife. And the last, a stone marks, excuse me, a stone without words marks the shore where he'd stood, penniless, waiting for the boatman. And just to uh, tell you that Seymour was telling the truth, and not everything about this book is depressing, even it is mostly about dead people. Not everybody in this book is dead yet, though. We all will be. Um, do any of you know Philip Lark Larkin? Philip Larkin? Can you hear me? Philip Larkin? His most famous poem, This Be The, this be the Verse. Right? They, they fuck you up, your mom and dad. They do not mean to, but they do, and so he's on. Dead. He's dead, yes. No, I didn't say he's not dead. So this... this no, well, this book is, is um, inspired by Philip Larkin's work. It's all the poems in here are somehow inspired in reference to uh, the poets. It's called Jump, Don't Jump. Plod on, plod on, it's not so bad. Mum managed it, so did Dad. Mornings drowned in mustard fog, days in endless well, nights like tar. We were born, we'll die, what's the rush? Rope or razor, pills or high ledge? Jump, don't jump, it could be worse. The gray beige air, the limping clock, that grinning idiot in the glass and the boozy truth, which is this? The other side, it might be the same. Plod on, plod on through the sucking muck. And I'll read two more. Evening. Um, this one is called Upside Down. Do any of you know Eduardo Galeano? Uh, Latin America. Um, Veins on Fire, he was known for giving a book about Latin American history to um, Barack Obama. He was a journalist. He's, one of his books was called Upside Down. Took a, I found him a, certainly a worthwhile uh, writer. He was from Uruguay. And as this, it was about a dozen years working on this, and one of the, well, I, well, I guess in, inevitable things was that I'd write a poem about someone who was still alive, and then died before the poem and <laughs> Don't try the poem <laughs> Oh I did but I threw it away it wouldn't, didn't do you justice <laughs> Upside down Strange times my dear the executioners walked off the job the judge commuted the sentence to whatever the prisoner chooses which is can you believe it a marriage proposal to the prosecutor promptly accepted in distant Madagascar, a dodo rose from the sand and sang, though so far as we know, these birds never sang before. At home, the news briefs were equally distressing. The generals in their big hats and uniforms and the CEOs in theirs concluded a suicide pact. After breakfast, of course. The cleaners found their note in the afternoon. Such regrets, it reads, such regrets. The queen and her minister, old and accustomed to hedging, preferred exile. The ship sailed off at midnight, a sickle-blade mood unhooked from the cranes on the, clock, on the docks and followed her out. The Wall Street boys checked themselves into the loony bin. 
They're out there on the lawn now, rolling joints and giggling at the clouds and the colored bits they pulled from their phones. Yes, yes, strange times. The camp guards have forgotten their whips, the secret policemen, their wires and dynamos and special chairs. They've come to our school and made no arrests. They're digging flower beds and hanging their heads. They brought geraniums and violets, but the children prefer roses. It was only the admin and the priest who'd had their throats cut. Their bodies still litter the foyers of the better hotels. Though in the interest of public health, the blood's been mopped up and velvet ropes set out to deter the curious. My dear, Guarani have come down to Montevideo. They've pulled their pirogues out of the estuary and set up park, camp in a park. San Martin and Columbus have traded their pigeons for laundry. A woman roasts a fish and laughs. She's read, it seems, both Rousseau and Marx. Strange times, my dear. The landlord's dropped in for tea. He brought back the rent, a chicken, and Turkish sweets. My friend Michael's got his old job back. He's fixing things that make other things work, things supremely useful and fun. Yes, the blacksmith's at his anvil, shaping plowshares and scissors. Lovers frantic in the night know the night will not end. And the milk of our sorrow tastes of cardamom and honey. And I'll read a last poem for uh, Tal al Maloui, who is, a, is or was a uh, young Syrian girl who was arrested when she was 17. She posted a few poems about uh, Gandhi and wanting to live a better life. And um, she was born in Damascus and she was reported uh, killed sometime after her arrest. And then there's reports that she was released and it's not quite, I don't think anyone quite knows. But, I mean, someone does, but uh, I, we don't know what her fate was. Poem, Death and His Kin. When Tal came home, they were already waiting. Two were on a street corner a fat one who held his arms wide, like the ex-weightlifter he was, and another of forgettable description, wearing a beige windbreaker, as this was December. Two others jumped out of a white van, a Toyota. They grabbed Tal by the collar and shoved her inside. Slut, hissed the one, whore, shouted the other. We'll not talk about what went on between then and the trial. Tal's father called on every friend and cousin, and friend of friend of cousin and in-law. Tal's mother made the rounds of the usual ministries and police stations, including the ones you crossed the street not to see. And always the answer was the same. We've never heard of her. Did she run away? Was she seeing a boy? Don't be absurd. We don't arrest children. When Tal's case came to trial, the judge looked exactly as a judge should look. That is to say, like her grandfather, and kindly. And death, when he came, he stood on grand steps surrounded by his generals and his kin, and beneath an enormous portrait of himself, he waved to the adoring crowd. Thank you. Thank you so much. So in conclusion, uh, here in the Alfred Pellin room with uh, his mosaic up there, which shows the great varieties of human expression and religious belief, and it's always, uh, it's always been an inspiration looking at it. And I think that's a Pellin too on the other side, if I'm right. Uh, so this is why it's called the Alfred Pellin room. But let me just tell you a few things more before we let you out to attack the cookies and buy some books. Uh, we have the three books. Bridges, uh, the, the uh, drawing is uh, of a photograph of one of the contributors to the book who couldn't make it tonight. Uh, she's a full-time teacher with a big family. She couldn't make it tonight. But she took a, a photograph and then did a drawing of it and extrapolated. So it's from Laurier Bridge looking down, I believe, towards the bridge that's between Parliament and the Chateau Laurier. So that's the cover here. And my book, uh, the publisher had trouble, so I was lucky because my wife, Sharon Katz, who's an internationally known animator and artist, she did a wonderful drawing of a uh, pomegranate in the beginning and end to fit the book, and I think it's come out to be an absolutely lovely cover uh, for this book. I don't know who the artist is of the book that Nicola's book is. It's been done by Guernica edition, so I don't know who the artist is. Oh, really? Your daughter? 
Huh? It's been a family affair all around here. Yeah, so his daughter did the, the cover to uh, publish by um, Guernica. And if you look at the bottom of our poster, at the left is the sign in English and French, our two official languages of Library and Archives Canada, which I'm pleased to say is becoming a, a, a very important literary center here in Ottawa, more than just national, but also local. Sometimes we forget that there is a local artistic community in Ottawa, it's not just national. And I'm just thinking back to 1991 on January 15th when uh, Nicola joined me with four other poets uh, to launch a book called Six Ottawa Poets. Uh, we launched it here, but I think downstairs in the writer's room, uh, that's 1991. So we've had this long connection with Library and Archives Canada, which I hope we will continue. I want to continue it because it'll keep me alive. So I want to keep coming here and launching books. Uh, after that, we have the uh, Varied program, which has supported uh, uh, conferences and will continue to do events as partners with the uh, Lowy Collection and with Library and Archives Canada. And we have uh, annual lecture and other things planned. The next uh, icon blue is of Silver Age, the publisher in St. Petersburg, who took the risk of publishing this Canadian book. And who knows, they may start a whole new fervor for Canadian poetry in Russia. Who knows? We don't know. But if it does, it started with us. And after that is the Writer's Center at All Saints. All Saints is the new hub in Sandy Hill, which used to be All Saints Church, which is now a community hub. And there is now a Writer's Center that's starting there, which uh, I'm heavily involved in. And we're also a partner with Library and Archives Canada to do a number of events, especially two weeks from today, the Leonard Cohen homage, which is going to take place here in this room. Uh, and you've met some of the performers already, two of them especially. Well, three if you had me as the reader. After that, we have my publisher, Ronald P. Fry, who is an IT and uh, internet publisher in St. Catharines, Ontario. We have a sideline of literary publishing. You can look up their website, and I'm pleased because when they do these books of mine or any others, they do a beautiful job. It's not just a quick uh, book printed by a mass production printer. They always put effort into the design. So some of those books are there for you to buy if you wish. And to the right of it uh, is the insignia for Guernica uh, uh, book, uh, Guernica editions, which has been going for, oh, uh, at least 35 years, started 50 years now, 40 years. Uh, started in Montreal as a kind of Italian-Canadian trilingual press and now operates out of Oakville, Ontario, mostly as, a, I think, an Anglophone publisher and publishes. And then there's FC, Friday Circle. That's the little uh, unit that has a website at the university which has featured chapbooks and books free, of course, by students who studied with me over the past 20 years. You can just buy the Friday Circle. Just, it's not Friday Circle, the prayer circle. It's Friday Circle, the literary circle. And you'll find it online and you can read a whole range of poetry books which were only published electronically and I am grateful to Library and Archives Canada that when we first started in 2004, we were the first in Canada to do it, it we were immediately, immediately archived. So I always never worry that those books would disappear at the blip of a, a, some kind of electronic, um, uh, some kind of electronic mal malfunction. So thank you all for coming tonight.